Well, hi everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, uh, Exposed Network Monitoring and Major Security Concerns. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Madison Filmer. I'm Hyperfire's community lead. So I'll be your host and facilitator today. If you have any questions throughout, just pop them in the uh, comments section and we'll uh, get to answering them during the Q&A uh, a little bit at the, uh, at the end of the uh, webinar. Um, and I'm now going to introduce your experts. Um, so we've got Martin Boyd. Uh, so Martin is a former executive manager um, of cybersecurity at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia um, and cybersecurity lecturer of Macquarie University. He is now the founder and director of Vertex Cybersecurity, which is based out of Sydney. Um, and his company provides relevant, actionable and industry leading uh, cybersecurity advice, services and solutions to organizations of all sizes. Um, we've also got uh, Stefan Crandall. So Stefan is the CTO and co-founder of Hyperfire. As a former Curtin University um, PhD, <laughs> PhD and lecturer um, in cybersecurity, um, and, and as an experienced threat hunter, uh, Stefan has first-hand understanding of the evolving threat landscape. Um, when he's not writing code um, <laughs> and staring at PCAT files, you can find him enjoying coffee with his wife, uh, herding cats at home, or trying to explain to his non-tech friends what he actually does. <laughs> um, so we'll just jump right in, right on in. Um, so we're going to start with Martin. Um, I just have a question for you. Let's throw it out there. Uh, in your opinion, what are the challenges your clients are facing at the moment in terms of cybersecurity? Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Madison, and thanks for the uh, introduction. Um, so look, I mean, there's always a lot of challenges in cybersecurity, um, and I mean, it masks a variety of things um, and we it's actually quite a big scope um, but what we typically find though is a lot of companies are looking for good security good cyber security uh, and good cyber security i'll be honest the, the short answer is they go down the um, certification or the iso 2701 so why invent a new standard when there's already a good standard of what good security is um, which basically covers 114 different things um, of those 114 things a lot of them uh, manage when we can help them manage. But one trips pretty much every company up again and again, and it is um, monitoring and essentially monitoring of their of their network. And that one comes up uh, every time is, is, well, look, how do I how do I do this? How do I manage this? How do I make, simplify this? And be honest, most people, most businesses are like, to be honest, I just don't have time um, to deal with this. So it's like, how do I actually resolve this? So that's that's a big one that we're seeing. Um, obviously, we see it across the board, but that's the, if I could say it, what is the, one of the, I guess, the, the hardest challenges that facing at the moment, that's definitely one that keeps coming up um, uh, with clients, definitely. Yeah, it's quite hard to balance that. Uh, yeah, that we're just finding that a lot of people don't have the time to, to do that and, and actually put in like the resources to do it, which is a bit of a, a shame. Um, can you... Yep. To briefly explain what uh, network monitoring is. Yeah, sure. So the network, um, kind of like the roads, uh, is used for connecting computers so they can talk to each other. Um, the, the thing is, is that channel or connection, that network connection allows communication in and, and network data out. Um, but what it also does is it allows you to use it for useful purposes, like obviously, you know, uh, for uh, browsing Facebook and other activities, little joke there. Um, but it's also um, useful for the bad guys for being able to essentially send essentially messages back and forward for themselves to uh, compromise your systems. And so the challenge is, in a lot of cases, when you think about it, when um, when someone wants to hack you, um, you know, they want some levers to pull. And so what are the levers? The levers are going to be sent over the network. So if you think of it, then um, when they're sending malware, when they're trying to compromise the system, they've got essentially a remote control somewhere where they're sending commands and buttons that they're picking and choosing, um, which means essentially all those communications go over the network. So uh, in short, if you're monitoring that network, then there's a chance you have of actually um, reviewing, finding and detecting those. If you're not monitoring that work, network, uh, then there is no chance of you finding it. And what's going to happen is, um, at least from a network perspective, and essentially uh, what will happen is, is they will do their impact or they'll do their damage. Um, and if you're lucky, maybe they made a mistake um, and it, it's not as big a damage. But um, so the network monitoring is really, how do you put eyes on that data that's going through so that you, um, that you can uh, detect it at the very, very early stages mm. and essentially um, prevent any, uh, any, any major impacts. Yeah, yeah, no, perfect. So in, in terms of what you've found um, in, in, in network monitoring for your clients, um, 
not necessarily what you found, but what are the some what are some things that you um, can find with network monitoring? What are the main sort of threats that you can find? Yeah, look, I mean, the truth of it is, is uh, everything goes over the network. So you can find huge amounts. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a bit of a Swiss army knife, right? So I wouldn't suggest you use it for everything. However, on that note, as I say, is, is you could use it to detect phishing attacks, right? Because phishing attacks are going to um, pages. You could get it to detect malware. You could get it to detect rogue employees. You could get it to detect a whole suite of things. Um, because at the end of the day, once again, everything has to go over the networks, over the roads to happen, which includes all these activities, because all of them are hitting a web page, opening up a URL, downloading a file, um, or you know, remotely connecting into something. So all of those are sending packets, which all can be intercepted. That said, um, there are some things that are a lot better detected on the network um, or uh, than, than other things. And some tools are better than other things. So I wouldn't say you would use it for all of them, but at the same time, it is a good measure which you can use for a lot. So it's actually really quite versatile and powerful. Um, where its strength is, is definitely in um, really around that sort of malware um, and uh, uh, adversary on your network. So essentially, which is through malware, um, where they're on your network or they're on your computers. And essentially, not only are they trying to compromise that machine, which gives away network signals, which um, can be detected if you're doing network monitoring, but also um, it actually is also on the, on the network um, sending communications in that local network, which also is sending signals. So if you're monitoring those signals, you also gives you hints that um, that something's happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, and then you can take, you know, um, immediate action to uh, essentially stop that. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, that's yeah, very important. I mean, the earlier the better, right? To, to find if something uh, is on your network and and stop it. And Absolutely. And... Awesome. Yeah, um, and then look, and, and to that point, what we see in most hackers, um, they usually spend, they usually take between on average, what we typically see is about one to two weeks from when they've actually compromised your system, your device or network before they actually start doing their damage or start doing what they, their, their activities. So if you can actually stop them in those early couple of days, uh, you can actually have essentially a zero impact. Yeah. Are you finding that, um, that with your clients, most of them have a more reactive sort of um, mindset in terms that they don't really implement things until it's it's kind of too late and they've already they've already been sort of attacked or yeah look I, I think it's I'll be honest the the issue I think you look that is one way to look at it is it's reactive mm -hmm. um, I think from their perspective they're they're not thinking it from that perspective am I reactive or am I or am I proactive I think what they're thinking about it is um, and, you know, it's a challenge we all have. We all have weaknesses. We all know more in some areas and less in other areas. Um, and so what happens is, is they have to make, unfortunately, an executive decision in an area that they're not skilled in. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, that means that with the information that they have, it's it's hard for them to make that decision. And so, generally, their, their decision is going to be, um, well, it, you know, I look at it. I touch it. It looks all right. It feels all right. I've been doing the same thing for years or I've seen other companies doing the same thing for years. That seemed okay. So clearly um, that's an okay decision. Um, the, the challenge with that is A, the attacks are getting more sophisticated. B, they're continually changing. Um, and uh, and it's not as simple as that. And I mean, you know, the really simple example would be for us, our own security, you know, which I'm happy to talk to, the amount of things that we apply um, is, is more than, to be honest, any other company that 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 I know, um, besides from maybe one, um, and then that would probably be, oh no, we're more than that as well. Um, so, um, but yeah, so the steps that we apply are really, really high because I know exactly what the bad guys are. I know what they're capable of, and I know how easy it is for them to cause so much damage. So it's one of those things is if you actually knew all the information and had the experience, you would make a different decision. But they don't, um, and part of it is is um, they also have to manage bus and budgets and costs. So that's a it's it's a difficult situation to be in for them. Yeah, definitely. No, of course. Right. So Stefan, we've got a few questions for you, and uh, <laughs> let's get let's just get been, you just been here. here sitting and listening to Martin. It's been really good. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So Absolutely. can you would you be able to sort of touch on why firewalls and endpoints aren't aren't working? 
Oh gosh. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's not so much they're not working. It's that um, we're sort of using them for something that they're not like designed for. Um, the the fundamental answer is trust, right? Uh, and that that goes everything from we trust that installing an antivirus or installing a firewall sort of stops the bad guys from getting in and stops them from messing around on our machines, all the way down to you know as like a cybersecurity professional, I trust that this particular endpoint solution will know all of these exploits that these attackers are going to use. And uh, the problem with it is, is that, you know, we we can't trust any given appliance, even if it's really, really good, you can't trust it. Uh, so you need to have multiple overlapping things that sort of look out for each other, right? Uh, and the reason for this is, is just taking EDR into account, right? Just antivirus, if you will. Um, you know, if I'm an attacker and I get onto a machine, before I do anything, I'm going to check to see if someone's watching, right? Uh, and being... EDR, it's it's on the machine, right? It's it's there. You can see it. So the smart and prudent thing to do, first thing to do, would be to either a figure out a way to avoid it, or b turn it off. Um, and of course, if it's off, I can't tell you if anything's happening there anymore. Your cool seam solution doesn't help because it's not getting logs. Um, we can't really do anything about that. Um, and of course, then any actions I take, you know, you're not going to see through that lens. Uh, and of course, this is where you have things like, oh, well, you need a firewall as well, for example, because then the firewall should see what the machine's then asking out to the internet, because they're going to connect back to the attacker's, you know, uh, command and control box and send those, uh, you know, commands, buttons and levers that Martin was talking about earlier across. Um, but of course, most cases we have is people just trust that installing a firewall solves the problem. And, and firewalls are more complex than that. Uh, you, you do have to actually set rules. They're a policy device. Uh, you've got to go through and set rules for what you allow in, sure. But something that many organizations, in fact, pretty much every organization I've ever worked with has not done is set rules about what goes out, right? It, we intrinsically trust that if it's coming from inside our network, well, someone we trust must have initiated it. But if the attacker's already on there, if they've managed to sneak on there using some sort of malware on a thumb drive, or if they've come in through phishing and they've got someone's password, so they seem authorized, um, that's not really going to stop that from happening because they're authorized to do that and we implicitly trust them. And being that we've not set any rules outbound on our firewall, it's not going to see the fact that this laptop is now calling out to this very scary server out on the internet as a problem because the thing that started it was the trusted entity, the laptop. Um, and so, you know, people assume that, oh, my firewall will catch that. And the answer is, you know, if you haven't actually set anything up, it's probably not. Um, so you're not actually getting things looking after each other. One of the neat things about network monitoring is that it sort of assumes a trust-free zone. It's going to look at everything as if it was just stuff happening. So regardless of whether or not it's going in, it's coming out, it's coming from something that's trusted, it's coming from something that's not trusted, it looks at it initially at very least as if it's all sort of the same thing. So what you can pretty much do is you can slap a network monitoring solution into a network and you can get at least some visibility across what all those other appliances are supposed to be doing and you can start to work together this sort of more holistic viewpoint one of the really neat things about network monitoring uh, you know if, if it's done in the sort of way that most enterprise solutions work uh, is that attackers can't actually see if one of these solutions is in play, because it's not running on any given machine that they are actually accessing. It's usually sitting off of a, a, a span port or a port mirror, which is basically like a, a mirror somewhere in the network where it's essentially the, the appliance is hiding behind a wall so no one else can see it. And it's sort of watching what's happening via a mirror. Um, and that means that it can see the attackers doing stuff but the attackers can't necessarily see it's there. So they've either got to do an assumption that there is one out there and they've got to act really, really carefully and quietly and take an enormous amount of time to do anything. Um, or, and what more often is the case, they just don't notice and they assume that everyone's not using it because most people are using just an EDR or a firewall. And they act really, really loud, which means, you know, Just drop EDR antivirus, <laughs> but you know if you're sitting on the net, if you're sitting on the network, generally you can uh, see around that. I'm guessing I dropped out there. I'm being told by Zoom that I've disappeared. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you just you just stopped for about thirty seconds when you were just talking about. Um, you said you know, or you can be really loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can you can either you can either choose to be really quiet or you can just be really loud. And most attackers will do this because they assume, well, if I can't see it, it's not there, right? You know, they 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 don't know what can be there, so they just kind of go, well, 
more than likely someone's not running something. So it can give sort of a uh, view that the attacker's trust isn't there. So you abuse their trust of an environment, which is hilarious, but it also means that you don't implicitly trust any single security appliance in your environment. Your network appliance is looking over the same sort of stuff that your EDR and your firewall are going to be looking over. Um, and that means that e those things are also going to be looking over. In fact, some more advanced EDRs solutions these days will look at the network traffic coming out of a machine as well. So you're getting that sort of overlap in all directions. And, you know, in that sort of case, you've got this nice sort of security visibility fabric that you can sort of see all things from different perspectives, which can give you really, really good understanding of what's going on. And at the end of the day, you know, you can pick out the things that shouldn't be there, i.e. the bad guys. Yeah. Okay. And so in terms of like, um, like firewalls and endpoints, where specifically does the gap sort of lie that that firebug can sort of help with? Yeah, I mean, that's that's sort of that middle ground, that sort of yeah. place of, you know, between everything. I mean, in for the first case, it's looking at things, uh, firebug specifically is looking at things differently to uh, everything else, right? Mm. Uh, antivirus is looking at things from a perspective of what did the computer say it was doing or what applications are running what are the logs that i got you know it's it's basically reading a an audit history of everything that's done on the computer and looking for anything that's out of place yeah. uh firewalls looking at is like a it's almost like a, a, a customs you know they're looking at the inbound and outbounds and checking their passports and just kind of going are you supposed to be here are you allowed to go where you're going or do i have to detain you um mm -hmm. and that's that's another way of looking at things firebug looks at things from the perspective of what the machines are doing sort of behavioralistically it's almost like you've got someone up in a tower somewhere who's watching these crowds of people moving around and if they see you know one person running okay maybe that's not too much of an issue but if then a lot of people start moving in the same direction okay there's probably something we need to go and investigate what did the guy that was looking at the audit trail see what did the guy that was uh you know doing the custom see is there is there anything else we need to do and of course from that perspective you can see things that an individual EDR agent won't see and that the firewall itself won't see because it'll be in the middle ground it'll be the behavior of the machines it'll be that sort of uh sort of space of communications and action that actually happens you know every day in your organization yeah awesome so what are some of the things that that you found um, on your clients' networks using using Firebug? Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I think I think my I think <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so the fun thing is is that uh most organizations, and I'm sure if anyone's watching this, it's like a uh that actually works like full time in IT and has an understanding of how crazy networks are. Most people have no idea what actually goes on in their networks. It's sort of like a you know, a deep dark sea where you're just kind of like, yeah, at the surface level, I can connect to these machines, but God knows what's happening under the surface. And and Firebug does provide that sort of visibility of the depths. So suddenly all these strange things that no one had any idea was going on suddenly pop up to the surface. Uh, some of my favorites just really quickly include uh, an organization that thought they were really, really secure in how they, you know, communicated out to the internet, discovered that they're in through, through us, that their entire uh, telecommunications infrastructure was beaconing out to Russia. Um, cause of course, you know, the firewall's not looking at that cause it goes up oh, telecommunications infrastructure that those, those are, you know, zoom boxes in meeting rooms and stuff, right. Uh, you know, we all have now, um, they're, they're, they're totally trusted. They should be fine. And of course, these things are doing all of their updates and, you know, sending out telemetry and, you know, their log information out to Russia. And of course the firewall's not picking it up cause it trusts it. And we're like, ah, uh, do you guys know that there's this weird sort of output to Russia from all of the things that do all of your zoom calls uh and of course they didn't right so they've got no way of knowing they don't have the visibility of it they don't have anything that doesn't look well that looks for that specifically um of course their zoom box thingies right they're not running an edr so how can they possibly tell you um another great one was uh finding like all this sort of weird activity was going on there's like files moving around all sorts of uh services being used and eventually figuring out that like half of the staff were accessing network uh uh things through a shared set of uh active like uh so um no, 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 uh, domain admin uh, credentials. So, you know, obviously whoever had set up the original network had just kind of gone, I can't figure out this permissions thing. I'll just give everyone all permissions when they need to do something. And that had created this like, you know, almost like network of uh, bypasses to all policy within the company. So yeah, sure. The policy says that I can't do this, but I happen to know from this guy that there's this account that I can use that'll just give me access to anything I need. 
And of course, you know, if, if you're in the IT team, you might be like, okay, well, all our policy looks really great and everything's sort of working. But if you don't have anything that's looking for, you know, again, an authorized user account, totally allowed to do these sorts of things that's just being used all over the place. I mean, you're not going to get that information. So of course, the strange behavior caused by people just being able to do whatever they like um, is something that we can go, uh, who's doing that? Oh, it's this one sysadmin. How is he in five different places at once? What's going on? Right. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 stuff like you know weird devices, uh, you know holes in security like that, things that are just not seen by you know a traditional firewall EDR sort of setup. Uh, it's the sort of stuff where we come in and go, yeah, did you know that this was actually happening, or did you know that this is a significant problem, or do you know what this sort of behavior is because it looks really suspicious. Uh, and of course, knowing that as the security team, as the IT team, as the organization, uh, you know, one, that it's happening and you can change it. And two, if it's something you trust, you know that if that changes or if something else happens that doesn't match with that thing that you actually trust, that's something you want to go and investigate pretty quickly. Yeah, no, of course. I'm curious now, Martin, what are, what are some of the things that you found while uh, network monitoring? Yeah, it's a good question. Um you know, lots. Uh, I'll probably jump in on in a sec, but one of the things that probably just came up um, while Stefan uh, was talking was um, what we what we definitely have found is every company that comes to us and goes, help me, we've been hacked. They have a firewall and they have antivirus. Yeah. Um, and any company we talk to about, hey, look, you should probably look at working, proving your security. They go, oh, look, I've got antivirus and a firewall. I think I'm covered. And I think that's just probably part of, you know, historically, that was all you needed if you rewired the time maybe, you know, 20 years ago, right? Yes, that's probably all you needed for the, the little sophistication of the attacks that were av available and performed. Um, fast forward to today, um, that's nowhere near enough. And obviously, we can see that because every company has been hacked from Apple to Microsoft to Google to to uh, governments, to um, Uber, to LinkedIn, to Facebook, to, uh, you know, just pick a company and it's probably been hacked, basically. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's one of those points is, 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 you know, what are you doing I, I, um, to do it? And are you doing enough of it? And look, from our perspective, so what we have seen, so obviously looking and monitoring the firewall. Um, so look, there, were, there was one case of, um, of uh, ransomware, um, which was detected and obviously it was going out and uh, uh, impacting everything, you know. Um, so, you know, that's something that you think, oh, well, only impacts the machine. But once again, the ransomware does talk back to a central server that does the control. Um, and then on top of that, um, it likes to spread its wings and uh, in infect or ransomware other machines. So it is then talking to all the other computers. So if you're on the network, you can pick that up earlier. Um, you wouldn't believe it, but ransomware actually takes days to actually ransomware all the files. It takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So the sooner you do it, the sooner you can actually stop it from um, ransomware that, that file. And I'll give an example. One company which... Um, and this is a you know an interesting version that spoke to us and said, "Hey, we've been hacked. Come help us." And we said, "Yes, we can help you, but here's what we need to do." And they went, "No, look, that that seems like too much. I think we've got this covered. Um, that's fine." Anyway, fast forward you know a period of time, and we follow up to figure out what happened. Um, and what happened is about three days after that, um, because they hadn't properly figured out, hadn't proper, properly monitored it, it, the malware, the ransomware came back, um, actually infected them again a second time. But this time, it, um, the first time it didn't get the backups. Guess what? The bad guys learned and the second time they did get the backups. Um, and so they went, oh, geez. Um, we need, to, we need to do better than that. And luckily, um, based on our advice, and one of the things we talked about was offsite backup. So they did some of that. So luckily, for just by listening to us, the saving grace, we were able to, to help them out. And then after that, um, it happened again, um, a couple, three days later again, because they thought they'd fixed it. So they got hit three times by the same ransomware. Um, and essentially, you know, they had antivirus, they had firewall, um, and it made no difference. So... You know that's what we've seen, and sort of you get the two variations there: what can happen and and what um, what can't happen. I guess if you've got monitoring, and um, look, monitoring is no, um, you know, like anything in life. There's there's nothing that's guaranteed or perfect. But I can tell you what: um, when you think of how much you can spend for like a really high chance of being able to detect it and be on it early, versus the alternative is, is you're guaranteed to not to detect it basically you're guaranteed to have no idea and you're guaranteed to get impacted unless by luck 
and chance they make they make a mistake or they do it slowly or do it incorrectly. Um, you know, I, I can tell you which one I, I would rather pick. And um, yeah, it's um, super important um, that, look, if you're not monitoring it, you're basically hoping and praying. Um, and that's what, when people call us up with these issues. Um, and then, um, another one, an RDP one, RDP box, that was out external focused on the internet and another one was an exchange server an exchange server both of them directly accessible on the internet compromised by the hacker and then from there they're able to leverage their network connection to do further damage so once again um, in those cases um, they didn't have network monitoring had they had net network monitoring would have been picked up well earlier and uh, and prevented and the impacts prevented um, and i'll be honest some of these examples i gave you um, the companies were probably this close to um, their end of life. Um, and they, they told me it was the worst days of their life, like literally, like they'd never mm -hmm. felt worse than that. So, um, you know, that kind of gives you some cage of where, and the first one we did find it, um, you know, they were, to be honest, it was too easy. Like the, it was resolved, removed, and they're like, oh, that was a bit of a pain, but, you know, thanks for that, and just moved on. It was non event. So hopefully that gives you kind of a couple of different flavors there. Yeah, whoa, that, I mean, with that company that got hit like three times by the, rent, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's probably, was. would you say that that's probably one of the scariest things that you've seen, like working with a client in terms of network monitoring or? Um, so in that example, uh, we didn't end up working with them. So, but it was definitely one of the ones that was most stressful. I mean, part of it, it wasn't too stressful for us because we didn't have anything to do. And yeah. obviously it occurred multiple times because we didn't have anything to do with it. So, yeah. you know, um, but it just it gives you contrast and compare, right? Like, um, unfortunately, sometimes you, you save a dollar to, to depend, spend a lot more. In that case, their entire workforce was unable to work because the systems didn't work for, um, for weeks. Um, so, you know, um, you know, if you think of the costs and time mm. that they spent in there, um, yeah, it, it, it just doesn't add up. But once again, people that are making these decisions in, in businesses and companies, um, it's hard to understand risk because I'll be honest, most people, it's like almost almost form of gambling, right? When you when you look at risk, when you look at the numbers, it, it's you go 50-50, how bad can it be, right? But um, or, or 49%, you know, 49 out of 100. I couldn't lose that much money, surely, right? Um, you know, but but roll the dice enough times, and uh, and yeah, the outcome will occur. No, definitely, no, of course. Well, we've got some times now uh, for some questions from the audience. So if you've got anything, um, feel free to chuck it into the uh, into the questions box. Um, I do have a question in the meantime, though. So, I mean, either either one of you can answer this one. Um, why why do you think that we're seeing an increase in tools and attack uh, methods? Oh, geez. Uh Mostly it's just because uh, there's money involved, really. I mean, you know, in, in the first days, the guys that were doing the hacking were all just like, hey, I can put my name on a website. That's really neat. Mm -hmm. um, but now it's like, you know, what is it? Uh, I can't remember. It was like 2018. Uh, the average pay for a malware developer out in the darknet was something like a million US dollars a year right? Like that, okay, most of that's hazard pay, right? Like, you know, if the feds get you, that's it. But, um, you know, in terms of the profit that you can get from some of these ransomware things, because because a lot of businesses pay, because if these guys get you good, right, and you have no other option, your options are pay the money that they've calculated, by the way, they've looked at how much money you've got in insurance, they've looked at how much money you make. And they're like, ah, you guys can pay this much. So you either pay that much, or your business goes out, like, good luck. Um, so the choice at that point is pretty stark, right? They know how to make people make a really good risk analysis when they're already been when they've already been bitten by the shark, mm -hmm. right? But you know, that's that's a ton of money. So you know, there's a huge incentive in developing these campaigns, developing these pieces of software, using them effectively, making the money. And of course, on the on the uh, I guess blue team, if you will, but we're actually including all of the pen testers and stuff here and security researchers as well. In the security side, um, we're developing a lot of these toolkits and tools that break into machines. And most of the time, we're developing it to figure out how to stop them from working. The problem is, is that very often when we've built the tool that can blow everything up, it takes a bit of a while before everyone's installed the patch that stops it from blowing everything up. So if attackers are fast, and very often they are, they can take cool tools some guys made to demonstrate and prove a point and turn around and blow up a whole bunch of machines that 
you know, the security team or the IT team hasn't been fast enough to patch. And there's a there's an ethical argument discussion in there on whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing. But um, you know, again, if you weren't developing it as the good guys, the bad guys would, and you'd have no knowledge of it, you know, even just with zero days for days. Um, um, but uh yeah, yeah, you know, as part of this, because it is an arms race almost, it's it's an evolutionary struggle at high speed. Um, you know these things are being built more and more because people want them and there's money in figuring out how to fix them. So, you know, there's, there's just so much money in the space now that, uh, you know, it just drives so much uh, demand that, you know, I guess, you know, these people are supplying for that demand. No, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have anything? I, I just, oh, yeah. I, I'd probably say, yeah, definitely. Um, it's, a, it's a huge business and then the money does drive all of it. But you've also got governments behind it as well. And then you've like exactly to, to Stefan's point, you've got the researchers behind it. And guess what? They're all sharing their attacks. They're all helping each other. So they're basically leapfrogging them forward. Um, and to be honest, the defenders are probably doing the reverse. They're not sharing their defenses and they're all doing it individually and not moving at the same speed. So um, look, it's, it does make that very challenging. Absolutely. But, um, and it will continue to grow while A, there's still money in it. B, governments still want to take advantage of it. Um, and C, there are still um, people not willing to spend or invest in the right ways to, to stop it and prioritizing other activities instead of it. Um, so they can continue to make money, then it'll continue to happen and grow. And it's part of the, I guess, the game of chess that we, that we have laid out ahead of us. No, definitely. Uh, we've got one from the audience. Um, so for a small security team who was getting increased visibility and network monitoring, we cannot focus on everything. Which aspects would you consider the most important to look at? Ooh. Yeah, great question. <laughs> uh, uh, look, to be honest, so just to put it in perspective, you know, I used to manage um, the same for the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, um, which had a lot of data in it. I can tell you when you're trying to monitor things and log things, the amount of data you will have will be more data than anything else you have to look at. Um, so what you gotta do is, is you gotta be smart about things. Um, and I'll be honest, you wanna use the right, the right people and the right tools to help you do that. Um, you know, this is a bit of a plug, but I can't help it. You know, you want to be looking at something like a hyperfire to help you look and filter out your network logs, you know, because um, I'd be honest, if, you, if you're trying to do it yourself manually or using one of those automated tools, which, um, you know, those same network tools, which um, are basically just got some rules, um, they give you too many false positives. So anything which gives you a lot of false positives, I, if you're spending a lot of time looking at false positives, um, you're looking at the wrong the wrong tool and the wrong way of doing it. You really need to get that down to something that you can you can resolve and get an answer on very quickly. Um, it's taking you half a day every day to look through all the false positives using the wrong method, the wrong tool. So so you know the obvious answer I call out is you know something like a hypey fire on the network monitoring, um, mm. and then na naturally. Um, you know, monitoring does expand to other spaces as well. But but look, start where start with the smart things first, and the things that give you the greatest return and greater co greatest coverage. Um, and so, um, if we're talking about monitoring, um, the the far the smartest thing is always network monitoring. Anything else, like I said, everything goes through the network. That's where you're going to get your best ROI in the monitoring space, um, without a doubt. And it doesn't mean you can't still pick and cherry pick and um, you know, do small captures you work through and, uh, and I still recommend that. And so look through, look through them randomly at certain occasions, but it means the overall bulk is, is you've got the, the right tool to help you analyze it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. You need to, you need to as best as possible, really, really target what you're looking for. And I mean, there, there is a way of doing this, right? Um, the, uh, the, the smartest sort of way of approaching it is to use intelligence, right? And, and then, you know, a lot of people will turn around and just say, oh, you know, intelligence is just IOCs. And it's like, not quite. That's one half of it, right? You know, you got, you got classic Sun Tzu sort of thing, you know, know your enemy, know yourself. They're the two kinds of intelligence you want. Uh, so the first kind of intelligence is, yeah, just make sure you know what kind of attacks are big and if they relate to you. So, you know, if you've got a team that knows what sort of applications are running on your servers that are vulnerable, that's a good place to start. But knowing what's going on inside your organization and knowing what the, I guess, the exceptions inside your organization are, where those weak points are for break-ins, 
that's really, really important as well. And, and that that is actually what Firebug is really, really neat at pulling out because it'll find that sort of weird stuff from just the behavioral perspective and go, what is this and why do you need that there? And being able to classify and know about that kind of behavior means that if you see something unusual happening at some point, you can go, is it because of one of these known weird things? Because if it's a new weird thing, okay, we need to respond to it. Uh, either figure out if it's some user doing something that they probably haven't done before. I don't know. I've seen weird things like users hosting their own what music servers for half the depart for half their department to listen to, um, or, or things like you know attackers you know now moving laterally around the network looking for stuff to encrypt. So you know in a, it, the ability to identify that signal from the noise is entirely dependent on knowing what in your network is important to you and what the bad guys are doing. So yeah, the bad guys doing stuff, but you want to really understand what's in your network so yeah definitely a good spot for firebug i'll take that plug from martin um <laughs> but yeah uh, well, it's, that, it's, yeah that, that's what we would do and recommend right we, mm. we would basically work on whatever we can to get the noise down to the lowest and i'll be honest rather than reinventing the wheel just talk to they're on which way i'll get the arrow right <laughs> on, my, on my side this side but but, talk, but I'd, I'd get talked to a firebug will talk to myself and we'll talk to firebug to um because that would be what i would recommend as the minimum starting roi if you want to get a bit deeper and dig into more things like you said yes you can get iocs you can pay to be honest millions of dollars for mm. iocs and filter everything through them um, you can even start setting up your own um what i call ios which is in indicators of safe um and you know you can start processing all that yourself and start kind of calculate you can start even to do some deception you can create some uh some boxes that look attractive to the hacker and then get them to set off alerts and attacks for you um but i'll be honest um and then you can start looking at you know monitoring the devices um as well but all of those things will cost you more and your return and roi on them will be less than the networking side so where to start that's where i'd start with doesn't mean they're not worthwhile doesn't mean you shouldn't do them but just especially with a small team um start with the things that get you the greatest value if you're talking monitoring um you know that that's that's the golden stuff um that, that yeah you really want to look at um the only other one would be dns you know um mm. You know, if you can, if you manage, if you can manage your own DNS and and monitor it all there and route it all through there. Um, but guess what? Um, the Hyperfire does the DNS yeah. monitoring built in, right? So, um, um, but that that would probably be the the top obvious things that I, I would focus on. Yeah. Okay. okay. Excellent. Got it. <laughs> I, hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question uh, to the audience member. Um, I I'm trying to see if we've got any other questions going on at the moment. Um, I mean, I'd love to sort of pick your brain a little bit, Stefan, in terms of, I mean, you've got quite a big history in, in sort of threat hunting and, and, and things like that. Um, I'd love to sort of narrow down on what this absolute scariest thing that you found on a client's network has been. Oh my God. Um, oh, geez, that is hard. Uh, <laughs> if, if we, op if we open up to the whole history of everything I've whole seen, history, obviously, right ahead. <laughs> obviously, obviously I've spent some time going in when the business has already exploded. And most of the time when you get there, especially with ransomware, it's like, what can we do? And the answer is, do you have any backups? Do they still work? Um, and that's the best you can do. Um, I think, I think the most scary one was, ah. Oh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple of big ones that I've done. I've, I've I've dealt with some like APT threat actors, like really really scary guys that know what they're doing. And I mean, those ones are those ones are notable in that they you know they're really powerful and they 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 do not make mistakes. But um, they they're not actually scary to work with once they're there because you know they're very very business like. The the craziest one I saw, uh, probably the most scary one I saw, was uh, hunting down this uh, ransomware that you know we 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 you know. We're trying to find and we found that it had been executed by a sysadmin that had just left the company and because they hadn't managed their you know uh their, their users and they didn't have visibility of what users were doing on machines because they'd just kind of gone well we've got a firewall it's okay um this sysadmin had come in this disgruntled sysadmin had come in with um with netwalker which is like a a fileless uh, ephemeral ransomware that you know antivirus has real difficulty with because it doesn't actually have an executable just sits in memory like a ghost um, and had just taken out their entire system because he knew exactly where to hit them because he'd set it up 
So, you know, um, and, and yeah, as, as far as I know, there was like legal action as a result, but oh it was incredible. You were just like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, you know, you, you, you hear about things like, you know, bad guys stealing, pro, uh, you know, uh, credentials and, 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 and logging in as the, you know, SQL administrator or something at two in the morning and all sorts of stuff. But I, I'd like, it's, it's one of the only times I've ever actually seen a disgruntled, angry ex-employee deciding to take matters into his own hands because he just knows everything. So if, if there's anything for, uh, you know, you know, when you do, you know, let go of stuff, actually make sure they don't have the ability to do anything with their access before they're out the door uh, mm -hmm. is, is actually quite important. Uh, and, and obviously having that information on, you know, what's going on in the network, if they had, again, if they had network monitoring in this place, if they had any sort of monitoring beyond their firewall, they would have caught the bizarre behavior that would have been happening leading up to all of their stuff being encrypted. Because of course, you've got a user who isn't supposed to be there accessing all sorts of things that he's not supposed to be doing and running software that dials out to the internet that it's not supposed to be doing in the first place. Mm. So... <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> and if I can jump in there, yeah. it's one of those things is how many of these events like go public, right? Like how many, I think that's part of the problem, right? Is, is these are happening literally, you know, all the time. Um, but most of them get covered up or sort of uh, reduced to almost nothing, nothing from a visibility perspective or publicity perspective. Um, and I assume in that example, besides from the legal action, it was probably nothing else that yep. went Went, went out from it yeah yeah you really do feel like you're in the secret service with um incident response <laughs> right because because yes. like none of the organizations that this happens to want to talk about it because of course they don't because it's embarrassing it's bad for their you know publicity Reputation. and everything like, it's yeah. obvious but yeah. but Correct. it's like if if you don't share this you know sure that one guy is probably not going to go do that to five more companies but you know if it's a ransomware group it's their modus operandi they're, they're going to be looking at specific verticals they're going to be looking at people with the same sort of uh procedures so if you're sitting there and you don't know that like three other organizations in your sector have been hit you know you you can't adapt to that ahead of time right it, it, the sharing really is caring in this case it's just you know yeah. it's it's tricky because businesses don't want to share with their competition specifically and and they, they definitely don't want to reveal that anything you know potentially you know not good for their reputation has occurred uh, even if it's not even like a full break-in even if they haven't gotten in and done something if it's been mitigated they're just going to be like we're not talking about it there's no reason to talk about it, it didn't do anything mm. but the fact that it even happened at all that information is so valuable to the entire uh you know good guy ecosystem right we we want to know so we can you know inform policies on firewalls tell our network detection stuff what to look for and tell our antivirus stuff what to look for like it, it all feeds into itself no yeah. definitely yeah and it, so it comes does come back to sort of the point i was saying before right the good the bad guys are sharing their malware and their fireless mm -hmm. hacking techniques and and uh but the good guys aren't aren't sharing what's happened to help the next person defend against it hmm. yeah it's a very yeah. very scary word out there isn't it <laughs> cool. yeah absolutely no, well uh, i don't have any other questions um and we don't have any more from the audience so um how about we wrap up and let people go get some lunch um so yeah thank you so much Stefan, for sharing your insights and a big thank you from uh to martin as well from vertex Cybersecurity uh for sharing your expertise and being here virtually with us today um and of course a big thank you to our attendees uh for tuning in if you do want to find out more about hyperfire or vertex please visit our websites or reach out to either myself um to <laughs> to martin or to uh, Stefan. And keep an eye out for our upcoming webinars. We'll be uh, posting a recording um, of this on LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover, uh, be sure to leave a comment. Um, yeah, thanks for coming, guys, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank yeah. you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Mary.